that's an important thing. I also want to mention that one of the reasons why we're pushing so hard on this order is not just to take care of the current communities, but because we see a big train wreck, well, it's already here, but this big train wreck of increase in contamination. And if we don't get a handle on it, we're just gonna, you know, we're just screwing with our livelihood and our heritage and our future. I suppose I should have closed with that. So anyway, I'm gonna be very quick. You know, I had all my things nicely typed up on my cute little uh, Microsoft product and then it decided to die. So now I have everything written down. So excuse my lack of specificity and refer to our letter. So basically we agree with some gr things. We agree with you that tiering is great. We agree with you that third party um, activities are great, that having them do some of the enforcement and some of the monitoring is a great idea, that the nitrate loading risk level is important information and something that can be handled. Okay. Um, it's trying to save me. Um, and also, I think it's important, we also agree that anecdotal evidence is not the way to go. So I've been hearing all day long, um, this is what we hear, this is what I believe, and I want a program that's not going to tell us that. So one thing I really admire about Jeanette is she only told us, she gave us some anecdotal information about the community she worked with, but she also gave us actual information. And if you give us the ability, we'll do more information. So we also like the idea of the right to appeal decisions to the executive officer. We appreciate that you don't want to change the annual groundwater monitoring, but since the state board has also um, approved in concept the cooperative groundwater program on the Central Coast, I really don't understand what that means. So when you say you're not going to hear the groundwater, you're not going to act on the groundwater monitoring piece in the Central Coast program, yet you've already approved a cooperative groundwater monitoring program that doesn't comply with it. I, I just find that somewhat confusing. So anyway, we have some changes, and I'm not going to be specific. I'm just going to say a couple major things. Is There's a lot of vague language in your proposed amendments, and I don't understand that. So for instance, Provision 11 talks about projects that improve water quality. Well, you're not doing a project to improve water just to improve water quality. You're doing it to meet water quality objectives. My understanding is that's the legal language for that, and that's what you should say. And um, if you have something, and also um, in the annual compliance report you, in uh, 44G, they talk about standard farming practices. Well, that doesn't really have a legal meaning to, to me, and if it did, I don't think I'd like it because I believe that standard farming practices are what got us where we are. So you should be using best available technology or best, or BPTC, best practi practicable treatment and technology. And also I just want to um, echo what Steve Shimmick said about changing in provision 33, the word avoid to minimize. Um, you need to do more changes because what you said, what it did say was avoid contributing to exceedances of water quality objectives. And now you said minimize contribution to exceedances of water quality objective. And I honestly think that's not legal. So I think you should consider that. And my attorney's here and she'll, she assured me that I was correct, that that's not legal. And so just generally speaking, there's a lot of information here that's not specific. You need, to be, you need to be clear about what you're asking for. The other whole big question is this idea of nutrient reporting. And I think that the recommendations are extremely confusing. I've been reading them over and over and over again. And I, it's clear that you're doing something good, which is requiring nutrient application reporting. And I differ with Stephen on that because I think it's critical that you know how much fertilizer they're applying and how much... Uh, how much is in the irrigation water, how much is in the soil, because that tells you relatively where you should focus. Like, should you worry about a grape grow, about a vineyard that's applying at a nutrient ratio of 1.2? No, you should be more concerned about um, baby lettuce farms that are applying 400 pounds per acre per year. So I think it does provide valuable information, but you also need more than one piece of information. So when you're solving an equation, simple algebra, you need more than one component to actually solve the equation. And it's interesting, in the East San Joaquin order, they're actually doing nutrient balances, and that's one, that's the only thing they're planning to report. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, so, but they don't wanna do 
uh, nitrogen application. So, I'm a, so I think you need both. I think you have to have some idea proportionally what's going on, and you also need to know overall what the loading is so you understand the impact of that. Okay, and then the expert panel, I just am a little confused about that. I was glad to get the clarification today. Um, because the, some, one of the things you asked the expert panel to do was look at nitrate charge discharges to groundwater. And I wasn't sure if that wasn't something more for hydrologists. And having a panel that has a lot of agronomists on it and one hydrologist, I wasn't really sure was the way to go. If you want an expert panel, maybe you need some groundwater experts as well. And maybe groundwater experts should have been looking, and maybe there were some, but I think that maybe an expert panel should be looking at your cooperative groundwater monitoring that's been approved for the Central Coast as well. Anyway, I'm happy to answer any questions you have on behalf of all of these organizations. Sorry I wasn't more detailed, but I am pretty familiar with groundwater monitoring and groundwater requirements, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Right, thank you. Okay. It, actually, we will read all of the comments in great That's detail. That's what I assumed. So, so focusing at the hearing is helpful for us, both to help understand the things we've already read and give us directive to the things we haven't read yet. Mm -hmm. So well, I was worry about not saying everything. It's I was raised to, to say everything in three minutes, so. Well, look, and you saved some time. You're going to win a prize for that. Oh, good. I hope yeah. it's chocolate. I, I have to think about what it is. Chocolate's good. Uh, questions? Uh, I, I, and I'm not sure. I think this might go to Darren or it might go to someone from the regional board. But did I hear in the, from the, uh, w the keeper, the first keeper that spoke, that the program as described will not do anything for Monterey County? Monitoring what? Sorry, I, I didn't hear the last part. She was Santa Barbara. Was it, oh, Santa just Santa Barbara. It was just Santa Barbara, not Monterey County. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. <laughs> yeah, I think you might be sacrificing some for surface water protection for groundwater protection. Okay. And I'm not anyone to say that that's appropriate. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because a lot of the examples that you've been giving are from Monterey County because that's where you're working yeah, and that's well good. That's where yeah. Well, there is some unsafe drinking water in the Santa Maria area, but I haven't been able to get to net to commute that far yet. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Oh, yeah. And are you volunteering to commute that far? Uh, no, you can come up and say so. You're not out of time, so... Go ahead. You're not out of time. Oh, no, not anecdotal. Okay, it's not anecdotal. It's, I, I talked to, okay, so um, I went to do a presentation. On, this is why it's not on the PowerPoint. I went um, to King City on Friday to do a presentation to a group of uh, parents. Uh, I've hooked up with Migrant Ed, and they've been really great in inviting me to present before parent groups. Um, and they were telling me about the upcoming rate increases in their community. Um, important to note that in King City, they once relied on 12 wells, but six of those wells have been shut down because of nitrate contamination. And one of the reasons for why their rates are increasing is because Cal Water has to drill two new wells to replace some of the wells that were shut down. Um, and we, I sat there with a calculator and did the math with a lot of these residents to calculate what percentage of their income was going towards drinking water, and the rate was 3 to 6 percent. Uh, CDPH says that you're only supposed to spend about 1.5 percent of your income on drinking water, but what we've seen in the entire region is that, no, people uh, realistically spend a lot more of their income on drinking water. Thank you, both from their system and from bottled water. Right. Thank you. Both. Shirley? Um, oh, just wanted to get a little context uh, for the communities that were just described and, and where, what aquifers, are they shallow aquifers uh, versus deeper aquifers? And the reason I ask is that, you know, one thing from the environmental panels, we, the, there's, a, there's a word I didn't hear the whole time, which is legacy. You know, this is a momentum system. We're dealing with this in, in other areas that we're urban runoff, et cetera. There's legacy of how we've developed things. So there's a legacy of momentum in nitrate contamination that goes back over 100 years. So we really want to focus, you know, source control in areas Conceptually, I'm just saying, 
uh, in areas where we can really start to see reduction. So you, you point out, for instance, that well that went up from 2011 to 2013 by 30 percent at one of the communities. You know, that shows that might be an increased trend. Is that an area that's a shallow aquifer that responds to management actions, or so, do you think so it's a deeper? So the increase I referred to was in the number of um, state and local small systems that are experiencing contamination. But yes, indeed, a lot of the communities that we work with have really shallow wells, about 60 to 70 feet deep. But I mean, if you look at the um, Camp 21 system, one of the test wells that they dug was a 680-foot well, and even that one came out to be contaminated. Um, and there, there's kind of exposure within the whole valley. I myself rely on a, a small drinking water system. Thankfully, we have and, two 750-foot uh, wells that we rely on. But even within our own neighborhood, there's uh, two parcels that serve about uh, four houses each that have about 60 foot uh, wells and they're both nitrate contaminated. So it's, it's mostly on the shallow end. And we do see a lot of that um, seasonal variability where, where um, contamination goes up and down the valleys that you see. So. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> So the numbers that in your PowerPoint uh, that you refer to, those numbers are statewide as far as the increase in contamination? No. Or, okay. Those are just data that uh, I've gotten from Monterey County because Monterey County actually samples from two wells to f two con uh, connections to 14 connection systems. Very unique. You don't see a lot of other counties doing that. Okay. So there's been a lot of, uh, not a lot, but several uh, comments made throughout the day that a number of growers are already complying with the order. So um, and not much in terms of specifics. So uh, with respect to the groundwater sampling that's going on, have you seen that um, that has translated to additional information to the impacted communities? Um, so if a farmer tests and finds out, even though they're not necessarily required to report specifically uh, on, on the well, um, are farmers contacting um, those that are receiving water, receiving drinking water? A lot of this information is not shared with us, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of intention behind that. Um, but uh, I. I think the Central Coast Regional Water Board would be better uh, suited to answer that. I will say, can I say one thing? Um, I was contacted by regional board staff about where I could find, uh, how I could share resources with them because they did have one grower that was only Spanish speaking and unfortunately no one within the county environmental health department could speak Spanish in order to help them. So. I mean, it's also important to re consider the kind of resources that are available to those growers once they do get that information back. Mm -hmm. so. I don't know if you guys want to say anything. Did you have anything to add? Uh, approximately 900 growers chose, chose individual monitoring rather than cooperative monitoring. They submitted their data to us, groundwater data. And it's from irrigation wells and domestic wells where there are domestic wells present. And we have been following up with them on the results of that. They have, the farmers have been contacting users of that water, have been informing them. Uh, we gave them a template of information, you know, a, a war warning type information to give to users. They're giving that information out and in many cases providing replacement water and reviewing their practices to see if they can reduce nitrate loading, even though, as you pointed out, uh, Mr. Moore, that there, there isn't going to be an immediate response in the well to changes in practices on the surface. Nevertheless, one, it does lead to reviewing one's practices, and we encourage that. And our staff, on a daily basis, are having those kinds of conversations with growers. We have a team of people implementing the program, and every single day, they're talking to growers about the results from their wells and about their practices about these nutri nutrient balance ratios, about their crops, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. And I, I assume that you're, you can provide that 
uh, information in Spanish or other languages? We do. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panel as well. Um, we now have our uh, final panel before we go to public comment and then uh, rebuttal. Um, CDFA led with some others. Ms. Schubert, do you want to explain how you want to use your 20 minutes? Hello. Um, I'm Sandra Schubert. I'm the Undersecretary of the Department of Food and Ag. And I'm just going to make a quick um, couple comments before I turn it over to our experts. First, I'd like to start by thanking the chair and the board members for giving us the opportunity to talk on some of CDFA's um, present efforts and collaborations that we've been working with on research and education with growers and through our program with UC Ag and Natural Resources and certified crop advisors. We've been collaborating with regional boards. We'd just like to update you on some of that. And um, I want to set a little bit of a context about how important this issue is for us. As we look around the state at dwindling resources, both water and land resources, it's even more imperative that we figure out as population increases how to deal with the nitrate issue. We have to grow a lot of food to feed an increasing population. And California is one of the best places to do that for a variety of reasons. Some of it is the diversity in our climate, our crops, our commodities, our resources, and we're so good at what we do. So we think we need to be part of the solution. We're going to have to feed as many people in the next 50 years as we have in the last 10,000 years combined. And we think California Ag has to be part of that solution, but that we can do it while providing safe drinking water to community members. And a lot of steps have been taken already, and I know there's objections out, but um, the Hard Report po points out that in the last 30 years, synthetic fertilizer use in California has leveled off, and we're producing over 60% more crops. So farmers voluntarily, for the last 30 or so years, have taken significant strides. A lot of it's been working with CDFA, with RCD, certified crop advisors, and our CS, a lot of technical as assistance to step forward and make these types of actions. So it's complicated in California, and I hear this Midwest statement all the time. We have over 400 commodities in California. We have five out of seven biomes in the world. I just did a quick look up on my um, iPhone. Kansas has 13 commodities, Iowa eight, Illinois seven. They each have one biome. It's a lot easier to manage nitrogen and grow crops in a place where you're growing less crops and you have one climate and weather structure. So our diversity allows us to grow more, but also makes these issues much more challenging because in the Salinas Valley, on one side, you'll use nitrogen differently than you will on another side of the valley to grow broccoli. If you're growing a head of broccoli that you want to be beautiful because you're going to steam it, you're going to grow that differently than if you're trying to open it up because it's going to go in soup. So all these complications you're not seeing in Nebraska or Iowa or Illinois. So, um, so we're glad to work with you guys to leverage the agronomic ex expertise that CDFA has with the expertise of the regional boards, our sister agencies, and our other experts. So we're going to talk about some of the training and collaboration and research we're doing. I'm going to pass it off to, I think we lost one of our experts this afternoon. I apologize to Dr. Asif Mann, who's taking the lead at CDFA, and Dr. Doug Parker, who takes the lead for UCANR. But again, thank you guys so much, and it's been great working with your team, and we look forward to working with you more. Thank you for the engagement. It's great. Good afternoon. My name is Asif Mann, and I'm branch chief at CDFA. I oversee six programs. One of those programs is fertilizer research and education. And uh, Dr. Parker is going to follow me. And then we had experts from CCA program, certified crop advisors, but he had to leave for a family reason. Let's see how we can cover his PowerPoint as well. So, <coughs> okay. How about this? Uh, the topic of our presentation is going to be how we can manage agriculture nitrogen. I mean, we already know that the issue is there. This is 
Here we go. Uh, I'm going to share this with you. This, this is not a flow chart. This is a diagram, and this is an effort to explain the complexity of the issue. In the center of this issue is nitrate nitrogen, which we are trying to address at the source point and uh, also supplying safe drinking water and meeting uh, all the safe drinking water quality um, goals. Uh, you can see on the left side, does it have a laser pointer? No. On the left side, you will see there's a water board, and there are regional water boards, and you have their, they have their own goals and mandates. Then you have water coalitions there. Then you have farmer on the left side. CDFA on the left side, we are engaged with UC system and also with USDA to provide research or fund research which can address the issue. And then you have CDPH, they have also responsibility. For the grower, I'm going to explain a little bit more because of the diversity, as Ms. Schubert said, not only the diversity within California of the environment, diversity of the crops, and diversity of the environment, microenvironment, but there's a new technology which they are applying or they can use. And then there's a professional help which they can use. So the grower is at the focus of this whole thing that how a grower can make that change or in their pattern or growing crops uh, to make this demand of managing agricultural nitrogen. My focus is going to be that what tools we can provide to the grower which they can use to better manage their nitrogen. Through fertilizer research and education, we have a wealth of data which we can provide to them or through our education we can provide technical tools or decision making tools which they can use. Uh, so we have started three initiatives and one is accessibility of the FREP research. Uh, regarding the FREP there was mention that there was a, a technical group put together in 1988. It was CDFA actually who put together that nitrogen uh, tracking uh, uh, technical group. There are 12 members on that. I do have names of those if you need. I can, I can give you those. And they published the report and submitted it to the legislature in 1989. They identified the area of high-risk nitrogen. They made a set of recommendations. As a result of their recommendation, Fertilizer Research Education Program was started in 1990. And that program is funded through middle assessment on fertilizer sale when a lost licensee sells it to a consumer buyer. That's where the mill assessment is charged. Under, uh, under the law, we can have up to two mills uh, on per dollar sale of uh, fertilizer, and currently we are at two mill at the maximum level allowed for the program. So three initiatives are accessibility of FREP research, focused research, technical education, and I'm going to go through those very quickly. Uh, we had wealth of data, as I said, for 22 years of research, over 162 research projects which have been completed. Over $12 million were expanded for those projects. We have created a database, which is online searchable database. What we have done is we have taken all the technical reports and we have summarized those into a simple format so that a, a common person, a grower or crop consultant can access that. I'm going to go back one slide. The search criteria, we kept it very simple. You can search it by keyword, type of the crop, or the area where you want to look at for research. For example, if you want to look at that what research was done on nitrate, this list will come up. And we kept it very simple in three columns. On the left side, you will have the topic which was addressed through research, and then the geography and the crop. So you can make a selection and go and you can look at the report. And the report, we kept it very simple. The top would be the researcher who did that, what was the highlights of the research, what was the method used, and what were the findings. But on the left, on the right side on the panel, we have extra links as well. If somebody wants to go and look at the original research report, they can also go and look at that. 
we are working on creating uh, crop guidelines, if I can make this thing work. Here we go. We are providing a new link, which is actually up and running, and that is fertilization guidelines. There were a lot of presentation and conversation this morning, which I heard, whether there are any set of guidelines. So CDFA is developing those guidelines for 10 major crops. Uh, so far, this would be the landing page. This is already up and running, and we have completed the work through UC Davis. Uh, we have a researcher who has looked at various research, not only PrEP, but all other research which is done on that crop, and has summarized into kind of guidelines. For example, one can select almonds, and if you select that, then this page will come up. And this page is not only limited to nitrogen, it's a phosphorus and potassium, because all those three major nutrients have to work together. Uh, so also, if you look at on the top, based on the growing type and the growing uh, the phenology of the crop, there would be recommendations which will be made. Uh, there's more to into it, but because of the time, I'm not going to go into this. But all of those, wherever you see I, those are interactive links. You can stay on this page. You don't have to go anywhere else. You can look at that at what stage of the tree, how much nitrogen you need to apply. And also, we have uh, supplied other resources, for example, how to take a tissue sample, how to interpret the results of a tissue sample, how to take sa soil sample in vari for various crops in various conditions, and how to interpret those results and use those as well. And also, when you should apply, how, should, how much you should apply, and what would be the benefit of applying those. I just want to share with you that he has gone through so much research and paper review to develop these kind of uh, recommend, uh, guidelines. <coughs> uh, focus research, uh, there was a mention on pump and fertilizer concept. This came through SBX21 uh, report. And this was one of the promising uh, recommendations. So what we did was in two, 2012, out of our normal uh, RFP, we did a special RFP uh, to have a proof of concept that how well this pump and fertilizer will work in cropping system. We got six project reports. It was reviewed by peer review and technical advisory subcommittee. Two projects were funded, one in the Central Valley and one uh, was on the coast and $700 for three years funding. This is a very unusual funding for us. Usually we do 220 or 225. Uh, it's a three-year project. These projects will be at the field level. In, in the Tulare Lake Basin, it will be almonds and pistachios. And at the coast, it would be lettuce and broccoli. And the researchers are from UC System. The group which we have in Tulare Lake Basin, it has hydrologists, soil scientists, agronomists, so we wanted a good comprehensive research. They're not going to look at pump and fertilize value. I'm sorry, I'm cutting into your time, doctor. But they are going to also look at that how much nitrogen actually goes down beyond the root. So they are going to look into that as well. Yes. Uh, we. The fertilizer uh, work as well as the, your irrigation system is. So we have funded a project with uh, CSU Fresno with the Center of uh, Irrigation Technology, and they have a mobile lab, and they are going up and down the valley and making these seminars, and those seminars are in four local regional language languages as well. We want to make uh, growers aware of how much, how long, and how when to apply, and how much uniformity is uh, important. This slide, I'm just going to focus on that chart. The question was asked whether growers will use CCA uh, in San, East San Joaquin Valley Quality Control Coalition. They did, they did instant survey of the growers. I was in that meeting, and 92% of those said they will use CCAs for nitrogen management plan. Uh, next one is that even before you ask the question. So he had a slide. There you go. I just made that chart up after your question. No, I'm kidding. Yes. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, this is about the nitrogen management training, and we are doing this in collaboration with UCANR, and Dr. Uh, Parker is going to talk about that. And I just want to touch on what is CCA program. It is run by American Society of Agronomy, and anybody who wants to become a CCA, they have to go a series of tests that they have to go through to become a CCA. What we have done is we have added a value to that. Once they become certified, then they have to take the nitrogen management training, which will be done through UCANR. And with that, here's Dr. Parker. All right, good afternoon, still, still afternoon today. Um, what I want to do is just touch on, um, if I can go backwards, there we go, touch on a, little, a couple of the things that are going on at the University of California working on nitrate. I've been, we're working on curriculum development and training. Um, obviously, there's a lot else going on by individual faculties, by uh, different research programs that we could touch on at, at other points if we wanted to. Um, I'm going to be talking about creating a training for nitrogen management. My background is an, I'm an actually an agricultural economist, so don't ask me any nitrogen questions. Um, but I've spent 20 years working on nitrogen issues, mostly in the Chesapeake Bay for the last 16 years and now out in California. So I have a lot of experience on policy and working with nitrate issues. The purpose of our program um, is really to uh, help farmers um, enhance their economic and the environmental benefits of improving their management of agricultural uh, nitrogen use. We're not here to teach them how to fill out a form for a regulatory agency. We want to teach them how to manage nitrogen. Now, if they do a good job of it, they ought to be able to fill out the forms as well. But we want to go beyond that. We're not really here to just teach to the regulation. We, we're trying to create a curriculum that, that helps them uh, move on. Our initial target audience, as was explained, was the CCAs. We're planning on five trainings, four in the Central Valley and one in the Salinas Valley right now. Um, it will be set up as a two-day program, um, where the first day will be a general session for the CCAs, training on nitrogen. I'll go through a little bit of that in a minute. And then the second day will be concurrent sessions, where we break them out by um, annual crops versus perennial crops, and we'll also uh, modify some of the training to go with the region where we're doing it. So we will do different trainings, you know, to for the geology, hydrology, weather, other things based on the region. Here's a brief outline of, of the first day of training right before you here. Um, the objectives of the course, I said again, are to promote um, environmental management and enhance economic benefits to farmers by managing, better managing nitrogen. Um, we'll also um, have some presentations on sort of what's going on in your region. We'll, in certain regions, we'll get someone from an irrigated lands program or something to come and talk and give the, the CCAs that kind of a background. We move on and talk about the nitrogen um, crop cycle, all the things that go with nitrogen, denitrification, um, leaching, you know, where are we concerned, those kind of things. Move on to talking about nitrogen sources, different types of mineral forms of nitrogen, how nitrogen moves, um, how it contributes to irrigation, uh, how irrigation is a big part of that and contributing to the sources of it. So there's a quite a bit that needs to be done with that. And then we move on to irrigation and nitrogen management. We haven't heard a lot about irrigation here today. We've heard a little bit about drip and other things, but some of our research is showing really that irrigation is very key to nitrogen management and may be certainly more than 50% of the issue is how do we irrigate and how do we control the water? Because that nitrogen doesn't move down to the groundwater if it stays in the root zone. So we're very focused on how the irrigation component of it's going to come into play when we do that. Finally, we get to nitrogen budgeting. Um, it's not just matching supply and demand. It's looking at the conditions you're operating under. It's realizing what you can do to minimize that environmental impact um, while keeping profitable agriculture going. And realizing that ratios, while they do convey some information, there are problems with ratios as well. Um, you know, for instance, you can never get to a ratio of 1.0 that you're going to put in the exact amount of inputs that you get out as outputs because you're going to lose some to the environment, whether it's to the groundwater or to the air. Even a, hydroponics, a hydroponic system that's completely closed loop loses some nitrogen to the air. So you can never actually get physically to those kind of levels. Day two, again, was the breakout into the perennial and the, crop and the others. This is a little bit more focused. Um, on uh, what's going on on the ground, how does each type of crop work, what's the loss potential in different crops, what kind of BMPs can they be using 
um, to do that. And then we end with sort of a planning manage, uh, management planning exercise where the CCAs will take a couple of scenarios and work through what would be a good nitrogen management plan and then we throw them some kind of a weather event or something and say how do you respond to that and how would that work. That's a quick overview of the training that we want to do. Our timeline is we've been working on this since last October with CDFA, with the CCAs and other partners. Um, we've got a steering committee that's me been meeting. In fact, I was on a phone call at 3 o'clock out in the corridor with them um, earlier today. Um, we've got our program goals. We've got the curriculum outline. We're developing teams. We've got 50 plus people who are going to be helping to do this, not just from UC, from the Cal States, from the USDA, private sector, others, helping to put all of this together. Last slide. And, and so where we're going forward, we're creating the curriculum now. It should be done by the end of October. We've got a very tight timeline because we have constraints. We're trying to get CCAs trained up and going fast. So we have uh, editing being done at the end of the year, and we start the trainings next January. So we've got trainings planned again in those five locations, January through March of next year. And then the question is what goes on beyond that? Um, we're going to do videotaping of the training. There'll be websites available. How will we handle for future years? Because this isn't a one-shot kind of thing. This is something that we'll need to go on and on. Thank you. Did you want to start something? Thank you very much. I have very a question. Sure. So uh, how many uh, individuals are you expecting to target? And is this an actual requirement for okay. those that are certified in California? Okay. So it, it's not a requirement that CCAs take the training. It's voluntary. Um, there are, I believe, over 700 CCAs now in the state of California. And um, what's going on in the, C in the Central Valley Board um, would be that CCAs who might need to be certified to sign on this will have to take this training. So part of the training is the CCA will get a certificate that they've taken the training, and that gives them um, a new, like a nutrient management certificate. Did I get that? Uh, my question is for you about research. Uh, I, we, we get visits, for, as, as I'm sure you do, from uh, various new approaches to, uh, to dealing with the, nit uh, the nit nitrogen issue. And uh, recently there was a, a, a company that came through and they had been working with uh, grocery stores to, to essentially use leftover pro produce, make it into a liquid, Add it to fertil to a fertilizer system that can you know without any change in the system, and you could reduce the amount of of uh, of the input for the from the nitrogen fertilizer by half, up to half. Is that I mean I that's just an example. Are you are there some other things that you see coming online that could be as dramatic as that? Uh, the programs which I supervise, it's not only the research program, I supervise also the product registration and also enforcement of fertilizer as well. The product are the type of product which you are mentioning, that's up, upcoming products, there's a new technology and people are trying to use all different sources where they can extract the nitrogen and then they can market their product with all the claims, the claims like you mentioned. So what we do is when the product is ready, they need to submit a proposal to us and register that product with us and they need to substantiate their claims that through research and we evaluate that research. We have scientific, scientific staff which will look into that whether that's even practical to achieve that goal or the claim which they are making. So that's one way of doing, but so far as the research which we are funding, our focus at this point uh, from last year has been that where are the gaps in our research? And when we did our database and our scientist not only is summarizing that re uh, research, he's also doing a gap analysis. Mm -hmm. that, that was a big achievement for us. Okay, we have gone through 162 projects over 20 years where are the research gaps? So that's where our focus is going to be in the coming years to fill those gaps. Sure. I, just, I think this speaks to California's leadership in, in terms of being, having irrigation efficiency and fertilizer Absolutely. efficiency. Yeah. You know, so, and you know, sometimes we feel like we're not pushing the edge and the envelope, but um, it's okay to bring in examples from outside the state, but really the necessity of, of, our, of, the, of our water efficiency challenges in this state 
uh, as well as economic challenges of agriculture, we see these are incentive enough to really innovate. And I, I salute your program in terms of really trying to show the science that we can use to base our management decisions on. I appreciate the comments. And our that little effort at uh, CSU Fresno is getting a lot of reception. And we want to continue that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. That was great. Now, it is um, 10 of 5. We still have public comment. We have rebuttal. Um, I, my sense is while we may want to keep going, just based on the time and looking at the wilting faces, I think we need, uh, not going to be long, five's too short, but coming back at right at five, we'll start with the public comment so that people can go outside and look at the sunshine, photosynthesize a little bit, get a drink of water, use the facilities, whatever you need so you can be fresh when you come back and we can uh, give our full attention to the public comment, which is also very important.
Are you going to drink that? No, I'm going to drink it. I'm going to take the shot. Well, tell him you can take a swig if he will.
Yeah, but then we'll be here really late. Don't you want to drive home? Don't you want to drive home tonight? Yeah, so I'd rather keep going. Uh, we're back. It's now 5.06 on that clock, just to be specific. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I don't have Janine, do I? You Is it okay that Janine's not here? Because Courtney's here. All right, so it's okay to start. It's in capable hands over there. Yeah. Okay, good. We're coming back. Thank you all very much. Um, I know it's gone late. We knew it would be a long day. Uh, part of that is because we had so many questions, but that's part of the process to help us come to resolution on the petition. So thank you all for your participation and hanging in there. And we're, we're not done yet. Um, we now have uh, public participation, which is a very important part of our process. I'm going to ask since it's late that people try to stick to three minutes. Some have asked for three, some have asked for five, some probably two. If you can keep it closer to three, that would be appreciated by others. The key is to make your main points for us to um, keep in mind as we go into deliberation on this next version of the, uh, of the um, decision. So I'm going to call in the order I received the cards. And first is Perry Claussen, Executive Director of the East San Joaquin Valley Water Quality Coalition. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Long day. Yeah. Well, thank you, Chairman Marcus. My name is Perry <laughs> Claussen. <laughs> Chair Marcus, sorry. I like Charlie Marcus. Uh, made me think of Charlie. Perry Clausen, uh, Executive Director, uh, taking me one minute for my info, Chairman uh, of the East San Joaquin Water Quality Coalition. I'm also Executive Director of CURES, a coalition for urban rural environmental stewardship. And the reason I mention that is that we have a CDFA grant that we are currently working on to evaluate instruments to measure nitrate movement past the root zone. Hmm. And we have two installations going on three on the central coast in broccoli and lettuce where we're looking at instruments to measure the movement of nitrates past the root zone. And we also have an installation in, in uh, Stockton on walnuts. So we're going to be looking over the next couple of years at answering 